Good evening, I'm Lee Wright. I'm the founder of History Camp uh, near Boston and with me in Virginia is... Hi, I'm Carrie Lund, the director of the Pursuit of History, the nonprofit that brings these History Camp discussions to you each week. We are excited to welcome Kate Moore today. Kate is a British writer based in London who writes across a variety of genres and has had multiple titles on the Sunday Times bestseller list and is a New York Times bestselling author. She is joining us to discuss her book, The Radium Girls, The Dark Story of America's Shining Women, which won the 2017 Goodreads Choice Award for Best History, was voted U.S. Librarian's favorite non-history, non-fiction book of 2017, and was named a notable non-fiction book of 2018 by the American Library Association. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Kate. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me on. And, and just and a note for the audience, Kate, as I mentioned, is in London, and we're having a little bit of a delay in response. So just be aware of that as we go through this discussion today. All right, Kate, it's, it's great to have you. Thank you for um, spending your Thursday evening with us, uh, especially given the time difference and everything. So we will we'll get into the literally horrifying um, result of, 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 of these individuals working with radium. And it's just, it's just ghastly, right? Hard, hard to comprehend, but let's back up. When was radium discovered and, uh, kind of what was it used for up until this, uh, use for luminescence for, for watches and dials and so forth? So radium was discovered by the Curies, Madame and Pierre uh, Curie, in December 1898. And it was actually used for all sorts of things because very quickly after its discovery, it was hailed as a wonder element. People were entranced by its immense radioactivity. They were entranced by the glow that it had. And they were also struck by the fact that it could actually destroy human tissue, you know, very early on, around sort of 1901, scientists realized that it was actually, you know, could burn, you could get a radiation burn from radium. So the uses that it was put to were countless. It was used to treat cancer with remarkable results. And because of that, because it was seen as this sort of life-saving element, people decided to try and exploit that. They wondered if this sort of healthful element as they saw it could be used to sort of give you back your pep in middle age so it was marketed actually as a health tonic people drank radium water uh, as a kind of vitamin to ward off ill health and the recommended dose was five to seven glasses a day now because it was seen as a wonder element it wasn't just limited to medicinal use uh, and you could buy radioactive dressings and pills and pads to treat things like hay fever or gout. But you could also buy radium butter, radium chocolate, radium toothpaste to give you a brighter smile with every brushing. And the women that I've written about in my book, The Radium Girls, they were using radium paint to make watches and clocks glow in the dark. And not just that, it also had a military use because they would use the paint to make the dashboards and the instruments of ships and planes and automobiles glow in the dark. So let's get to that in just a second, but, but the idea of radium butter, the idea of radium chocolate and, and, and drinking this, um, were, were people seeing ill effects from radium from that? Or was that kind of con uh, contemporaneous with what we're going to be talking about here with the use with the dials? Well, there's kind of a couple of answers to the question. Very early on, they realized that a large amount of radium was very dangerous. Um, in 1903, for example, Pierre Curie said that um, just, uh, you know, if you're exposed to it, it could um, burn all the skin off your body and destroy your eyesight and probably kill you. So early on, they had this realization that it was dangerous. But that was to do with large amounts and they thought that small amounts were perhaps beneficial to health and that's why it was put into this radium water into the butter and the chocolates you know the idea was that cocoa and sugar and radium would you know give you this buzz of, of energy basically um, and in terms of people suffering ill effects 
there were a couple of early cases where doctors thought that the treatment with radium was to blame, but the large bulk of evidence, so-called evidence, thought that radium actually was having a beneficial effect. They thought that it was stimulating the bone marrow and the red blood cells. One thing to note is that the people paying for that research that determined that a small amount was safe were the radium firms themselves who were funding and producing all of these many products. So of course they were looking for a positive result uh, and they found it. All right, now let's go to uh, these young women and the, the tasks they had. Talk to us a little bit about the, the company or companies and, and the specific thing these, these women were doing. Of course. So the radium girls were what were known as dial painters and they painted dials. Those dials could be the instruments, um, as I say, of military uh, gadgets or it could be a watch or a clock they would make the numerals glow in the dark. And it was very delicate handiwork. You know, the smallest pocket watch they had to paint um, was only, you know, about three millimeters across. So very, very tiny numbers that they were having to paint. Um, and one thing I liked actually in my research for the book is that when I looked up the girls in their local town directories, it didn't say they were radium girls or dial painters. When it showed their profession next to their names, it said artist. Um, and so this artistic nature of the work um, meant that it was a hugely appealing job. It was also very lucrative. And what these companies were doing, as I say, was producing this glow in the dark radium paint and then applying it to all these dials. Dial painting happened all over America, actually all over the world. In the book, I've chosen to focus on really two specific centers, one in New Jersey and one in Illinois. But there is evidence that dial painting was happening in many, many places all across America. And was it also taking place outside of the outside of the states? It was, yes. And there was, um, according to the research I've done, a very crucial difference between what was happening in America and what was happening elsewhere. And that is in Switzerland, for example, or in France, the women who were applying the radium paint to these gadgets would use an instrument to apply them. They might use um, a sort of steel pointed instrument or a glass pen to apply the paint. But in America, the women were told to lip point their camel hair brushes. Now lip pointing means that they would put the paint brushes laden with radioactive paint between their lips to make a fine point for that very delicate handiwork that I've described. And so ultimately what was happening is that the radium girls were ingesting radioactive paint every time they painted because they were swallowing the paint as they put the brushes between their lips. And uh, tell us when when this started being applied and the um, kind of the duration until there started to be some alarm around the the effects. So the paint was um, invented quite early on in the twentieth. century century and um, the companies that I've chosen to write about were established around sort of 1916 um, and of course the date is crucial because this being history camp you know people will know the first world war is just around the corner and because of the military uses that radium paint could be put to that then led to a huge boom in the radium dial painting industry um, so this was happening a lot. Everyone thought it was a wonderful thing. You know, my goodness, they got to work with radium, the wonder element. They all signed up to it. And you asked about when did concern first start to be raised? Well, tying into your previous question about were the people eating the radium butter and so on affected. The thing about radium poisoning is that it's very insidious. So it does take years to show itself. So actually, um, the first girl to sort of get sick the women didn't really start to get ill until the sort of early 1920s and it wasn't until 1922 that the first radium girl died from the radium poisoning she had suffered at work well it, it just uh, the, the 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 effects um just just horrific and i kind of hesitate but i do think we need to probably explain a little bit what what would happen to a young woman who had as an artist had been 
painting these dials? Uh, what might happen first and then from there? Well, as you say, it is an absolutely horrifying poisoning. So as I say, it does take years to show itself. And when it begins to manifest in a woman, it will, and I, I say woman because it was, the women were all, um, the dial painters were all women. Um, it would start very innocently and innocuously. You, the, you know, Grace Fryer, for example, one of the key radium girls I write about in the book, she just had a sort of aching back, um, you know, a pain that wouldn't go away, a little pain in her foot as well. Catherine Donahue in Illinois, who is again a central figure in this really important case and this really important story from history, she had a pain in her ankle that spread up through her leg before it settled in her hip. Other women felt it in their teeth first. And Catherine Sharp, for example, she went to the dentist to have her tooth that was aching pulled. And what happened to Catherine is that he pulled that tooth, but it didn't heal. In fact, the next tooth started to hurt, and then the next tooth, and then the next, until Catherine didn't have to go to the dentist to have her teeth pulled because they simply fell out on their own. The radium poisoning essentially had settled in the women's teeth and in their bones, their spines, their hips, their legs, their arms, and it would manifest in different women in different ways depending on where the radium settled in their body. It would settle in the skeleton but it could go in different places. And what was happening once they'd ingested the radium is that it settled in their bone. It's what's known as a bone seeker. It actually seeks it out, you know, biomedically. That's how the human body responds to ingesting radium. And once it settled in the women's bones, it there emanated that immense radioactivity that people were so fascinated by, sending out these destructive rays. And so when they studied the women later, they found that their bones were honeycombed and moth-eaten in appearance. They literally had holes in them, holes that had been drilled there by the radium while the women were still alive. So you can imagine that Grace Fryer with that aching back, it was a pain that just got worse and worse and worse. And she did eventually go and have an X-ray and they realized that her vertebrae had been crushed by the radium. And Grace had to wear a steel back brace to keep her, you know, to keep her standing erect. Women found that their bones would spontaneously fracture because of the, you know, way that the radium was destroying them from the inside out. And ultimately, eventually, cancerous tumors would start to grow in these women as well. And they would be enormous you know, huge, uh, you know, huge, really awful tumours that could grow anywhere on a body. You know, it could grow in your elbow or in your hip, which is what happened to Catherine Donahue. Even in your eye, they had some radium dial painters who had sarcomas in their eyes. Um, so these are the effects that the women endured. And I also just want to mention that, you know, we talked earlier about how people were responding initially to this small amount of radium they ingested and how people thought, oh, it's making changes in the blood and that's a good thing. But actually it was overstimulating the bone marrow so that the body couldn't keep up and the women suffered essentially pernicious anemia and many of them died from that effect. And how many, how many women were involved in, in the painting and at, at what point as some of these effects were being discovered, maybe not understood, but at least felt, what, what, what happened at that point? Well, so um, the radium girls um, were, you know, I, I've explained how it, it was happening in different women at different times and in different places. So that obviously made it very difficult for doctors to sort of join the dots because the women were presenting with different symptoms at times and that made it very hard uh, for the women uh, to actually sort of get anything, you know, coming together. And actually what really made the difference in their case is the women's friendships, because I mentioned that radium dial painting was seen as this artistic, glamorous, um, very lucrative job. So actually a lot of the women, when they were starting out, they would get jobs for their sisters and cousins and friends in the studio. You know, this is one of the tragedies for me is that when you know the women start to suffer the ill effects of their poisoning it, it's not just one daughter in a family who is affected it can sometimes be two 
or three or four. But actually those female friendships really came into their own because even though the doctors weren't joining the dots, the women would talk to each other, you know, even because at this point obviously the first world war is over and people have moved on you know grace fryer left the dial painting studio to become the head of her department in a bank uh, the women were not dial painting anymore but of course they, they were still in contact with sisters and cousins and friends and it was the women themselves initially actually who said there is something going on about this thing and they were the ones that that realized you know this is happening to all of us we all worked in the dial painting studio we have to try and get this addressed and looked into. You know, I skipped over something I, I want to go back to, and, and this is before these effects were being felt, uh, stories about how sometimes they might apply it to, before going out at night, uh, to kind of uh, enhance their appearance and, and, and walking down the street literally glowing. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, again, this is just one of the, the tragic things, you know, you can imagine these sort of happy-go-lucky women, you know, feeling totally blessed that they had this amazing job. Part of what made it amazing was this access to this glamorous glowing substance. And they were told it was perfectly safe. And of course, why would they believe otherwise when the drugstores and, you know, the, the supermarkets are filled with radium products, you know, because there were radium cosmetics as well. That was another sort of commercial angle well, I didn't even mention earlier, you know, there were face creams and uh, soaps and rouge with um, radium in them to give you a glowing complexion. So here the radium girls are, you know, these young women and they did tend to be really young. You know, many of them were teenagers, uh, sort of 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age when they're dial painting in the studios. So to have access, you know, immediate access to this glow in the dark paint um, that they can see is put into, you know, expensive Parisian cosmetics. They would use it themselves to paint their fingernails, for example. Um, one woman painted her teeth with it for a smile, you know, that would knock her date dead. Um, these women um, used to paint their the, the sort of buttons and the belts on their dresses. They were encouraged to by the company so that they could finesse their painting skills. And yes, you're right. They would literally glow and sometimes not from applying the paint to themselves, although they did as a cosmetic simply working in the studio would see them covered in this glowing dust from the radium paint because the women mix their own paint. They used a sort of powdered radium and would mix it with an adhesive and water to actually get a liquid paint. And so the studio was covered in this glowing dust, you know, almost like glitter. And it would coat the women, you know, their hair, their shoulders, their clothes. When scientists studied them, it had worked their way beneath their clothing as well. Their lingerie, their skin was completely covered in this glowing luminescence. And so they were actually nicknamed the ghost girls because when these women walked home at night, they would be shining like spirits as they walked home through those dark streets of New Jersey and Illinois. And Catherine Donahue in Illinois, she actually remembered that she and her friends, they used to wear their good dresses to the plant because when they would go out on dates after work, you know, going out and dancing in music halls or in the speakeasies as the Roaring Twenties sort of took hold, you know, the radium girls then would be the ones shining and shimmering on the dance floor. Um, you know, this was part of the appeal of, of the job, this glowing dust that would make them shine like ghosts. Yeah, amazing. Um, so now let's go, let's go back then to when the, the effects are starting to be felt and, uh, and, and young women talking to each other, uh, dis discovering that the thread is, is maybe not necessarily the specific manifestation, but they all worked at the same place doing the same job. And so there's, there's likely something here related to that job. Um, how, how did this play out? What was the reaction of medical professionals, the company and so forth? Well, medical professionals were really quite taken aback by it because as I say, there was this belief that radium was safe you know the american medical associations had it on its list of um you know new remedies that was added in 1914 and so it was still there you know so the doctors were perplexed by these symptoms and they didn't think that radium was the culprit they were however intrigued by what was going on but really no more than that um one of the most shocking things about the story for me 
is that even though dozens of young women had died, um, it wasn't until the first male employee of the radium firm passed away from radium poisoning that actually an autopsy took place and a medical examiner started to look into, you know, why are there so many deaths at this radium studio? What is killing these workers? It was only when a man died that actually the medical professionals took those official formal steps to start investigating what was really going on. So, so there was no autopsy uh, before that, is that correct? No, so uh, uh, the, the Dr. Lehman was the first person who passed away. He was the first person to be autopsied. And only after that did they autopsy any of the radium girls. And as I recall, there were some different um, protections or literally there were protections for some of the men working in the factory. Is that right? That, that's right. This comes back to the amount of radium that the workers are dealing with. So the lab workers who were largely male were handling large amounts. And as I say, from pretty much the turn of the century, they knew that a large amount was immensely dangerous. It would kill you. Um, you know, even the, the von Sohotsky who ran the radium firm, you know, he himself um, had lost the tip of his index finger because radium had burned it off. You know, he had been physically um, you know, injured by radium himself. So the lab workers were not permitted to handle radium with their bare hands. They had ivory tip tongs, they wore lead aprons, they took enforced vacations if they'd had overexposure. Um, and it's so striking, of course, that in the dial painting studios, which were literally in the next building along on the sort of complex uh, of this radium firm's, uh, you know, headquarters, um, the women are being told to put the paintbrushes in their mouths. No safety equipment whatsoever. They're not even told that there might be a danger. They're simply told that the most efficient way to paint is to lip point. And so that's what they do. And then, so if we, we've, we've got this, this autopsy, the, 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 the gentleman passing away, um, t take us from there. What, what is discovered? What's the reaction of the company? Uh, to what, at what point do, is there some engagement of, of, of lawyers or, or some, or journalists for that matter? Yeah, so, I mean, from a scientific point, um, it was really quite a challenge to sort of really determine decisively what was going on because no one had ever tried to measure radioactivity in a living human being before um, and that's what they needed to do because they wanted to try to measure you know the girls that were still suffering who had not yet died and so Dr Martland um, who was a pioneering uh, the chief medical examiner of New Jersey he pioneered these tests that would enable him to measure uh, the radon that was being um, expressed by the women, uh, radium decays into radon. So from a scientific point of view, there was, you know, it was a real sort of journey of discovery to try and devise these tests to realise what was going on. It was a type of radium poisoning that had never been seen in human beings before, this sort of low level, you know, small amount of poisoning, but the cumulative effect of taking it into the body day in and day out, you know, seeing these dreadful, you know, horrifying uh, results in, in the women. Um, now, the company's reaction to all of this is perhaps, you know, not surprisingly, um, to deny, to obfuscate, to mislead. They hire doctors to uh, tell the women that, of course, they can't be suffering from radium poisoning, um, even to tell them that, you know, they're doing okay. This isn't, this is not a, a, an issue, you know, according to their tests. They seem fine. There's no way that they're suffering from radium poisoning. Um, of course, for the radium firms, they don't want to admit the existence of this new poisoning because to do so means the end of all these lucrative, um, you know, product lines that I've mentioned. You know, the whole industry will come crashing down if actually it's proven that a small amount of radium is just as dangerous as they knew a large amount to be. So the company acted callously they didn't care about the women they had killed they didn't care about the women they had crippled and injured they didn't care about the women that they were still hurting they tried everything in their power uh, to hush this up um suppressing reports um you know doing everything that they could and of course that involved trying to silence the radium girls and to discredit them as well uh, one of the early radium girls had been buried on a death certificate for syphilis even though actually it was later proven that, you know, that was not the cause of death at all. But they kept bringing that up. They kept 
digging up dirt on the women, trying to suggest that these women were unclean, were morally unsound, so that they should not be listened to as these women tried to hold the company to account and to fight the justice. And, and so what happened following the autopsy of this, this gentleman? And at, at what point did this become uh, something that could no longer be kept under wraps by the company? Well, I mean, they tried for a long time. So what followed the autopsy of uh, the male employee who died is that they then tried uh, to use these new tests they've devised on two living dial painters, um, the Carlo sisters, Marguerite and Sarah. Um, they tested them and they proved that the radium did, you know, the women did have radium inside them and that was what was harming them. Uh, Quite quickly after that, um, Sarah passed away and she was autopsied. She was the first radium girl to be autopsied. And again, this proved that it was radium in her body that was harming her. Um, you know, they were able to see that it had, you know, affected her bone marrow. They could see that it was destroying her bones. Uh, they could see, for example, that, uh, you know, another symptom of the radium poisoning in women is that it would shorten their limbs. You know, they wouldn't only spontaneously fracture, but because of the damage to the bones, their legs would uh, shorten. So in Sarah's case, you know, one leg ended up being four inches shorter than the other. Um, so, you know, it was it was proven quite early on that actually medically this is what was happening. Um, but as I say, the company fought tooth and nail to try and cover it up. And the women really had to battle because at that time, radium poisoning, because no one had ever heard of it before, was not a compensable disease. You know, there was it, there wasn't anything in law to say that a company couldn't kill you with radium poisoning because people didn't know that it had existed. Um, there was also a two year statute of limitations. So because of radium poisoning being so insidious, you know, taking around five years to start to show itself, if not longer, you know, the companies and the lawyers were sort of saying, well, even if we did harm the women, you know, there's a two year statute of limitations, they can't possibly, uh, you know, file suit against us because of this. And so door after door was slammed in the radium girls faces. And it was only thanks to Gordon. Grace Fryer, who was the daughter of a union man, um, a woman who was political, who was smart, who knew right from wrong and wanted to see justice done and, you know, to work altruistically to protect other workers as well. She was the one who kept hunting for a lawyer. And eventually she found a very young lawyer called Raymond Berry, who was prepared to devise a sort of clever uh, response to this two year statute problem. Um, and he was the one that took her case and enabled the women finally uh, to try to fight for justice. Talk to us about that, the progress of that case through the courts and what the outcome was. So um, in the New Jersey girls case, um, it became a cause celebre. I mean, you can imagine, you know, it, this is such a, a tragic, horrifying story. And you had these, you know, women who were prepared to speak to the newspapers about their suffering um, and the public took them to their hearts. So there was an awful lot of newspaper coverage, which was a gift to me as an author trying to research this story because I was able to draw on interviews with the women. Um, and, you know, there was a, a lot of coverage to draw on and a court transcript as well. So in my book, The Radium Girls, I've been able to quote first person testimony from Grace Fryer and Catherine Sharp and the other women because, you know, they're there telling us, you know, on the stand exactly what happened to them. Um, so, again, the companies try everything they can to try and hush them up, to try to settle out of court before it even, you know, uh, it gets to be heard. But Grace Farrar shuts them down. You know, she was prepared to settle early on. But once they dug their heels in, she was like, no, I, I will see you in court. Um, so it's, it's a big, big case. And the women in Illinois start to hear about it because of the New Jersey girls' bravery in bringing it to public attention. Now, in the New Jersey girls case, because of the legal machinations of the firm, the firm are trying to push it back, push it back, push it back, delay, 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 so that the women will die before they see justice done. And the women are really suffering. So in their case, they decide that actually they will strike a deal and they will come to a settlement. Um, and so that's one of the things that happens in the New Jersey case. And, and then... Um... So given this, this higher profile and so forth, was there a uh, response from, uh, from politicians, legislators, regulators around this? Yeah, so one of the 
legacies of the Radium Girls case is that step by step and inch by inch, they start to change the laws. Um, now, some of them can't be made retroactive for their own case, but it means that they do protect other workers. So radium poisoning is added to the list of compensable diseases. Um, you know, people are working on the legislation all the time to try and add these protections into law so that other people are protected. Um, so yes, things are, things are changing all the time um, for, thanks to the radium girls to try and make things safer. Uh, in, in your research, you mentioned uh, the, the, the court testimony, uh, the articles and so forth. Um, did you have a chance to talk to any uh, relatives or descendants of, of these ladies? Yes, that, that was one of the most moving and powerful parts of my research, actually, because I was determined to speak to family members. Obviously, sadly for me, the women themselves, of course, have passed away, so I couldn't speak to them directly. But yes, I reached out to sons and daughters, um, to sisters, to nieces and nephews, and they were able to bring their family members, in a way, back to life for me. You know, I was... I was basically my driving force for writing the Radium Girls was to ensure that these women, these individual women were not forgotten um, and that their personal tragedies and triumphs uh, were recorded and commemorated. So I wanted to know every personal detail that I could find out about the women, you know, what their voices sounded like, um, you know, who was always late, what did they like to cook, what were their hobbies, what their personalities like. Um, and the families for me were just wonderful in in opening up hearts and homes, family scrapbook albums, you know, bringing out the women's rosary beads for me uh, to see and to hold. And, um, you know, it was a really, really special experience. Um, and I've been so grateful to the families for all their support for the book um, and the way that they have contributed to this story so that the women are not forgotten. Uh, so Kate, I, as, as people have figured out, you're um, uh, not, not uh, not not a not a native here in the states. What drew you to this story uh, with with all of the activity taking place in the United States? So I first encountered the Radium Girls through a play. Um, I was looking for a play to direct, and I googled "great plays for women" uh, because as a female director, I wanted to put on a, a production that had great roles for actresses and that you know starred women as the protagonists and not just the bits on the side. And one of the plays that came back on that Google search was a play called These Shining Lives by Melanie Marnich. And it's about the Illinois dial painters, so Catherine Wolfe Donahue, who I mentioned earlier. And immediately I felt a connection to these women through the play. Um, I ordered the script and read only the opening monologue from Catherine, it's just two pages in length. And even just having read that, I turned to my husband and I said, this is the play I have to direct next. The connection was that immediate that I wanted to tell this story on stage. Um, you know, women fighting for justice, um, strong women standing up for their principles, you know, the tragedy, the suffering, the sacrifice, the strength, everything about the story just was amazing to me. It just really connected with me. Um, and so I put on my production and of course, because I knew it was based on a true story, I did research, I wanted my production to be authentic. I wanted to understand who these people were we were portraying on stage. I wanted to teach my cast about them so that they understood the sort of reverence that we should bring uh, to this production. And through that research, I realized, actually the book I want to read doesn't exist. There is no book that celebrates these women that looks at their personal lives. There were books on the legal legacy that the women had left behind. There were books on the fascinating science of radium and radium poisoning and what had happened to the women, but no book that was about the girls. And so ultimately I thought, well, if no one else has done it, why don't I? So even though I was British, even though I lived 4,000 miles away from where the action took place, um, I felt this connection to the, the women. I felt passionate about making sure that their voices were heard and so even though I am from England and I live in England I determined that this was a story I had to tell in book form as well. Well that's wonderful and I should just make it clear I uh, didn't in any way suggest that uh, because you were there in England would make you less capable 
of, of researching it, and, and the book's been hugely well received. I just was curious in terms of what caught your attention, and and so interesting here that it came this way. So um, Carrie, I think, is going to join us and uh, and bring with her some questions. All right. So you know, one question is the cases in Ottawa, Illinois, um, were showing up in the early 1930s during the Great Depression. How did that affect the reactions from townsfolk, doctors, attorneys, and so forth? Well, um, as you can imagine, um, in the Great Depression, where so many people are out of work, so many companies are going bust, the idea of suing your employer um, is just absolute anathema. Um, the women are shunned by their communities. Uh, they're called fakes and liars. Uh, you know, even what you know. What is really striking to me about this story is even after the New Jersey girls case, you know, which becomes this international um, case. You know, people are, uh, know about it. They're writing about it. They're talking about it. Even after that case, dial painting doesn't stop. Uh, the radium products being on the sale in the drug stores and the supermarkets doesn't stop. Um, and so you've got this situation that even though essentially what's happened in New Jersey has sort of proven that there is this danger, people are not accepting that. The companies are not accepting that. They're still covering things up and lying uh, to their employers and indeed to their consumers. Um, and so when the women in Illinois are trying to file suit. The situation is completely different. It's not the roaring 20s anymore. It is the Great Depression. And so, yes, they are completely shunned by their communities. No lawyer, no local lawyer will take their case. No local doctor even will properly treat them, will diagnose them with radium poisoning. You know, even though Martland has devised these tests, you know, almost a decade ago now, these small town doctors uh, profess no knowledge of radium poisoning. Uh, and indeed, many of them did not have knowledge of it. Uh, but also it was about this sort of community closing ranks, trying to protect the sort of one employer that's left and that is still doing OK. Um, and so, yeah, the women were, were shunned not only by the sort of higher echelons of society, but also, you know, their very neighbours. OK, so the dials were used for the military in World War One. Were they still using them in World War II? I mean, you read something like this and you think, as you had mentioned, you think, surely this put an end to it, right? We're not going to use radium paint and radium in food and things anymore. But did that continue on? So radium dials, yes. Um, and the radium food and so on, that did uh, cease in the early 1930s. I think it was around 1933. Um, that the uh, FTC finally issued a sort of cease and desist um, to radium manufacturers who were putting it into those products. That was because um, a wealthy uh, white man had died of radium poisoning from ingesting these substances. He gave evidence to say that it was these radium products that had killed him and his voice was listened to. Uh, so at that point, they did stop um, producing the radium food products and so on, the, medic the so-called medicinal radium that actually was poisoning people, uh, you know, every time they necked uh, a glass of radium water, of course. Um, in the case of radium dials and radium dial painting, that actually continued right up until the 1970s. Safety standards were put in place, safety standards based directly on the radium girls that I write about in the book. And those safety standards actually did not only apply to the radiant industry, but actually all nuclear industries. So you think about World War Two, you think about the Manhattan Project, you know, people dealing with plutonium and uranium. And the scientist on those studies actually wrote about how he was um, struck one night. He had a vision of the radium girls who, of course, had brought this to public attention through their court cases. And he didn't want to happen to the Manhattan Project workers, what had happened to these women. So he insisted that research be conducted on these new radioactive materials that they were working with. They found they were biomedically very similar to radium. And so thanks to Catherine Fryer, uh, to, to Grace Fryer and Catherine Donahue and Catherine Sharp, they took what they'd learned from the women's suffering and the sacrifice, and they used it to protect the Manhattan Project workers, to protect the wartime dial painters, and to protect everyone working today in nuclear industries too. 
Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you. This has been fantastic. We've learned a lot. I think this is a story that is probably new to a lot of our viewers. It was new to me, so it was a really great um, foray into a history that is not well known but needs to be. So we have a link to Kate's book in the chat as well as her website so you can check out some of her other work. And if you like history that is really uh, keeps the human aspect in the forefront, you will really enjoy this book. So check that out. If you enjoyed this uh, this evening, there are a few things you can do to support it. You can tell your friends about it, share the emails and social posts, and consider making a small donation to The Pursuit of History, the nonprofit that brings these to you each week. Next week, we'll be speaking with Anthony Richards about the Christmas truce between British and German soldiers during World War I, and he has been able to access newly released uh, documents and archives and so forth to really kind of bring new light to this story. So join us for that. And thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And thank you, Kate, for spending the time with us today. Thank you, Kate. It's my pleasure. Th thanks for the opportunity to share the Radium Girl story. Certainly.